I hear it. I don't know what I'm hearing it through, but I hear it. I don't know what I'm hearing it through. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah, but I didn't. I turned this up so I can hear it through the speakers. You're live right now. Let me see. Um. this mountain so high I could not climb hello hello 
No. No. Rechargeable batteries. According to Bob, for the microphones, they are not very good because they wear down, and once they start going to the point where they don't take a full charge. He says they're good for about five, six. Then a voice touched my soul so gently. It was Yahshua when I cried out. He said, peace, be still, child. And let me lift you over. He said.
my Messiah mine. Lift me to the holy place, my Messiah mine. Shine thy light upon my face. Lift the darkness from my eyes. Let me see where Satan let me know the joy of life known only to you, my Messiah mine. How I long to be your bride, my Messiah mine. Through you there's eternal life. Let me learn of you. All I can guide me with your gentle hand. Let me know that I am always loved by you. Let me drink your little waters. Let me sacrifice the blood. Immerse me in your spirit. Oh, let me drink your living waters, let me sacrifice the blood, immerse me in your spirit, Yahshua. My Messiah mine, you have healed my many scars, my Messiah mine, I love you with all my heart, so grant that this in heart, let me live through your grace, let my soul be your hiding place, for I know that I just can't face this world without you. Let me drink you living waters. Let me sacrifice the blood. Immerse me in your spirit, Yahshua. Sacrifice the blood, oh, oh, immerse me in your spirit, your spirit, lift me up, my Yahshua. Let me drink your living waters and sacrifice the blood. Immerse me in your spirit, your spirit, lift me up. Hello, hello, hello. Volume okay? Want me to lower it, raise it? All right. Here we go. Good evening. My name is Tim McNamara, and I will be your moderator for this class. Welcome to the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research. This is a school and not a church. 
and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. We hold classes in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Lansing Branch was established in 1973. The Dean is Dr. Terry Walsh, and the President is Dr. David Underwood. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted with Lord. The true title of the word or son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted with God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1,400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and original name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the Word or Son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane 
as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also at this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, holy place and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional objectives and aims of the Institute are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah, without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained. There is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace. Our slogan is speak the truth. At this time, we will have a prayer by Dr. Graciela Underwood. Our scripture for this evening is Isaiah, the seventh chapter, to be read by our dean, Dr. Terry Walsh. I will be doing the announcements at the end of class. We will have a couple of selections, maybe from the choir. No, no choir tonight. And our readers for this evening will be the participation of the class. Good evening. Heavenly Father Yahweh, thank you that you have brought us here this evening so that we may learn more about you, your purpose, your pattern and plan. Through your son, Yash Messiah, the Holy Spirit, we thank you for all the blessings that you bestow upon us. 
。哈利路亚。Well, good evening. I'll be reading Isaiah the seventh chapter from the King James Version Bible, restoring the true name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to the text. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezan, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved, and the heart of his people, as the trees of wood, are moved with the wind. Then said Yahweh unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou, and shear Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field, and say unto him, Take heed and be quiet, fear not, neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and the son of Ramalia. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramalia have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabeel. Thus saith Yahweh Elohim, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. And within threescore and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramaliah's son. Ramaliah's son. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. Moreover, Yahweh spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of Yahweh thy Elohim. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt Yahweh. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my Elohim also? Therefore Yahweh himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken by both her kings. Yahweh shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. And it shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh shall hiss for the fly that is in the utter uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt, and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they shall come and shall rest all of them, in the desolate valleys and in the holes of the rocks, and upon the thorns and upon all bushes. In the same day shall Yahweh shave with a razor that is hired, namely by them beyond the river, by the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet. And it shall also consume the beard. And it shall come to pass in that day that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep, and it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall give, and he shall eat butter. For butter and honey shall everyone eat that is left in the land. And it shall come to pass in that day that every place shall be where there were a thousand vines and a thousand silverlings. It shall even be for briars and thorns." With arrows and with bows shall men come thither, because all the land shall become briars and thorns. And on all hills that shall be digged with the mattock, there shall not come thither the fear of briars and thorns, but it shall be for the sending forth of oxen and for the treading of lesser cattle. That was Isaiah the seventh chapter. A reminder at this time, uh, this is going out live over Ustream uh, for all the speakers to remind them, smile. You're on candid camera. 
Also, a reminder for everyone to please quiet all cell phones and or pagers so that class is not disturbed. Well, now our first speaker for this evening will be myself, Dr. Tim McNamara. Let me have Hebrews 9 and 1. Hebrews 9 and 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Okay, the first covenant that Yahweh made with the children of Israel back here. And uh, let me just, before I go any further, let me s just state this. That we come in here, this is a school, not a church. We come in here to learn of this divine vision that was given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, by Yahweh Elohim himself. And without this vision given to him, um, we would be in the dark. Okay, We would not know what Yahweh's purpose plan for salvation was. Okay, and um, all right. And one of the things that Dr. Kinley received in the vision was information on this tabernacle and just the importance of this tabernacle, because 50 chapters are dedicated to, the, to this, to the building, the construction, the function of this tabernacle. And in that vision, Dr. Kinley, it was revealed to Dr. Kinley just the importance of this tabernacle because this tabernacle is the pattern by which Yahweh Elohim goes by. Um, just a brief overview. Um, we have the most holy place, which is Yahweh himself. The holy place, which is Elohim, and the court roundabout representing Yahshua, the Messiah. Basically, you have a one, two, three. And that's what everything goes by. One, two, three. Everything is made up in threes. Atoms are cells. Um, atoms are proton, neutron, electron. Cells are the nucleolus, nucleus, and cell body. Okay? And along with this tabernacle, they're showing that nothing can get outside of Yahweh. Because with the proton, or with the atom, all functions of this atom take place within the circumference of the electron. All the functions of this cell take place within the cell body. There is not anything that takes place outside of that. Okay? Um, you know, you've got messenger RD, or RNA which comes in and, and encodes the message from the DNA. And it doesn't transfer that code outside of the cell body. It has to enter another cell body to transfer that code. Okay? And just like this, this, this tabernacle here, all the functions within this tabernacle took place within the outer walls or the court roundabout. So this is showing that nothing is outside of Yahweh. Okay, now let's go to 9 and 1. Hebrews 9 and 1. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service. Okay, and this first covenant was which Yahweh gave to the people um, on June 3rd, or Savan 3rd, when he... 6, 6, right. It was 3rd when they got here, 6 when he spoke down the law. And that's when he made that covenant with the children of Israel. Of course, he had made that covenant a long time ago, back there with Abraham also. Go on. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service mm -hmm. and a worldly sanctuary. Okay, and this is that worldly sanctuary and those divine services which occurred within that sanctuary. Go on. For there was a tabernacle made, mm -hmm. the first wherein was the candlestick okay. and the table and the shoe bread. All right, and this is that sanctuary. You got the, the golden lampstand, the table of shoe bread, and the alt golden altar of in incense. Which Skip is called down the sanctuary. To, jump down to 9, I think it is, 9 through 14. Which was a figure for the time then present. Okay, and this, this was a figure for that time. That time only, not now. But although it's, it is a, a key or 
it is a schoolmaster for us now. Okay. Which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices mm -hmm. that could not make him that did the service perfect. Okay, so daily sacrifices were brought here um, and, and brought, to, brought to the gate for the sinner. Um, he would have to bring an offering. If he sinned, he brought an offering. And that, that sin offering did not cleanse his conscience. Right? And, okay, go on. As pertaining to the conscience. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Ten, which stood only in meats uh -huh. and drinks and diverse washings. And that's what they had to do here. They brought meats, they brought drinks, and the priests and everybody, there were diverse washings that went along in this. Go on. And carnal ordinances. Mm -hmm. And these carnal ordinances that were imposed upon them back here, um, back here actually, when, Mo, when Yahweh spoke down that law. Go on. Imposed on them until the time of Reformation. Okay, until the time of Reformation, or the time that Yahshua the Messiah would come in and, and fulfill all these carnal ordinances and put them to rest. Fulfill them, is what he did. Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I don't come to destroy, I come to fulfill. Go on. 11th verse. But the Messiah, being come a high priest of good things to come, mm -hmm. by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, mm -hmm. not made with hands, okay. that is to say, not of this building. Not of this building. Not right here. Because this tabernacle here was made with hands. Many hands made this. But this tabernacle right here, the true tabernacle, was not made with a single hand. Go on. Twelve. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, mm -hmm. but by his own blood, mm -hmm. he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Okay, now yearly the high priest here would have to go in once a year on October 10th, um, which was a day of atonement. He would uh, go into this most holy place three times. The first time he would go in, he would go in for himself. He would have to sacrifice a bullock down here and take the blood of that bullock and put it upon the four horns of the altar and then carry that blood um, up here into the holy place. Um, I believe he also put it upon the four horns of the altar of incense. Okay, And then he would carry that blood into the most holy place and offer that up. He would sprinkle that blood seven times. He would face east, which means He'd be walking in the west, so he had to go all the way around that mercy seat, that Ark of the Covenant, and then sprinkle that blood seven times towards the east. And that was for himself and his family, because he had to atone for his sins first before he could atone for the sins of the people. The second trip that he would make, there were two goats that would be brought, two male goats of the first year, a lot would be cast for those two goats. Upon one lot would fall the scapegoat, and that goat would temporarily be spared. The other goat was the sin offering, and that was for the people around here that were camped around the tabernacle. And that blood also, he went through the same ritual with that, and he would come in here to the most holy place, and again, face east, and sprinkle that blood seven times upon the mercy seat. And then the third time he would go in there would be for the cleansing of the sanctuary, and he would go in with the blood of the goat and the bull. They would be blended together or mixed, poured together. And he would go in and offer that blood again seven times on the mercy seat. And then he would come out, and then he would also sprinkle blood here on the altar of incense for the cleansing of the sanctuary. So he made three trips in here every year. Every year for, what, 490 years, he made this, this trip. Okay? Yahshua the Messiah did it one time. One time only. And that was for the redemption of sin. This was just for an atonement of sin. Which basically Yahweh would just metaphorically say he was sweeping it under the carpet. You know, it wasn't like they were forgiven of their sins. Right? It was just an atonement. All right, go on. 13th verse. For mm -hmm. 
For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall uh -huh. the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to you, Yahweh, uh -huh. purge your conscience from dead works to the serving of the living Elohim? Uh -huh. Is that 14? That's 14. Okay, stop there. Um, Colossians 2, 9 through 13, I think, is the next scripture I would like. Colossians 2, 9 through 13. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay, okay now in Yahshua the Messiah here dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is Yahweh in physical form. Go on. And ye are complete in him. And you are complete in Yahshua the Messiah. Go on. Which is the head of all principality and, and he power. Is, he is the head of all principality and power. Not our president, not the bishops, nobody. Okay? Yahshua the Messiah. Go on. 11th verse, in whom also ye are circumcised mm -hmm. with the circumcision made without hands mm -hmm. in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh okay. by the circumcision of the Messiah. So we are circumcised, and this isn't a physical circumcision, although Yahshua himself was physically circumcised at eight days old in fulfillment of the law that was given to Abraham back there, way back there. Um, Abraham had to circumcise his entire household to show that covenant. Yahshua, the Messiah, and of course all the children of Israel, they had to be circumcised also. That was, that was a, a, a witness to the covenant. Okay, And he had to fulfill that by being circumcised himself physically. But that's not what the true circumcision is. The true circumcision, uh, circumcision is that removal of that shroud of carnal thought. Okay, that's the true circumcision. My teeth aren't working so well. <laughs> um, that's the true circumcision that Yahshua performs, is he removes that, that, that shroud of carnal lust away from you and, and teaches you, opens up your your spirit to, or your understanding to the true spirit and how he works. Go on. Twelve verse, buried with him in baptism. Okay, so you were all buried with him right back here in this baptism. When he was baptized, your faith is in Yahshua, you were baptized with him. Go on. Wherein also ye are risen with him. And you rose right here with him on that third day, you know, Go on. Through the faith of the operation of Yahweh. Through the faith of the operation of Yahweh, that Yahweh would send in his son to die, bury, and resurrect all according to the scriptures. Go on. Who has raised him from the dead. And he raised him from the dead. Go 13th on. 13th verse. Uh -huh. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, mm -hmm. hath he quickened together with him. Mm -hmm having forgiven you all trespasses. Okay, read that one over again. 13. And, I'm gonna... and you, being dead in your sins... Now, you were dead in your sins before Yahshua the Messiah came into your life. Go on. And the uncircumcision of your flesh... Uh-huh. ...hath he quickened... Now, he's quickened that internal spirit... Together with that him. that internal man, your soul. I shouldn't say spirit, but that internal, that soul, because that's the real you. That's the real you, not this, this fleshly thing that we're wearing. That's just something to dist help us distinguish one from another, I guess. I don't know. Anyways, go on. Hath he quickened together with him, uh -huh. having forgiven you uh -huh. all trespasses. Now, he has forgiven you all trespasses through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. All right. Um... Now, let's go to Isaiah 28.9. Isaiah 28.9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Okay, so Yahshua, that's who we're talking about, is Yahshua the Messiah. And, and 
If you're unsure of that, let's go to John 14 and 26. If you really want to be sure who is the teacher, this will tell you. Fourteen twenty six mm -hmm. of John. But the Comforter, mm -hmm. which is the Holy Spirit. Now the Comforter is the Holy Spirit. And earlier, Yahshua, earlier in that chapter, Yahshua had said that he would send, a, an, well, was it he or Yahweh would send another Comforter? Go on. Because he was a Comforter to them in the flesh at that time. Okay? He was their fleshly or physical Comforter at that time. Go on. Whom the Father will send in my name. Now, he's going to come in the name of Jehovah. No. no. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> no, he isn't. That's right. He is going to come in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. Go on. Whom the Father will send in my name, uh -huh. he shall teach you all things. Now, it's the Father, Yahweh, who is sending Yahshua the Messiah, who is the Holy Spirit or the Comforter. And that is who teaches you all things. Go on. And bring all things mm -hmm. to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Okay, now he was saying this to the apostles at the time because he had spoken to them personally. Okay, in the flesh. They were right there. You know, they heard his words. So he's telling them that they're, he's going to bring back to their remembrance everything that he spoke unto them. Well, he speaks unto us, too. You know, anytime you pick up the Bible and read it, he's speaking to you. Even, even outside of that, Yahshua is always speaking to you. And he is the one that's going to teach you the things about himself. Is that it? For 1426, correct. That's it. Okay, back to where we were. Isaiah 28, 9. Uh -huh. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Okay, so who's he going to teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Mm -hmm. Them that are weaned from the milk mm -hmm. and drawn from the breast. Okay. For a precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. You, a line upon a line. Line upon line. And line upon line. Here a little. Here a little. And there the, a little. To the, to, the, to the law. That's what they're talking about. Here to the law. And there, there a little. To the testimony. Go on. For with stammering lips uh -huh. and another tongue right. will he speak to this people. Okay. Now these precepts that were mentioned earlier in the verse, these precepts are the blood, the water, and the spirit. And these precepts run a line all the way from Adam to Yahshua the Messiah. The precept of the blood, the water, and the spirit always remain the same, but the manifestations of these precepts change or differ. But it's still blood, water, spirit, 40. Going back here with the Adamic transgression, we have <coughs> the death of, of Adam and Eve. Um, but the death of Adam for eating that fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which he was, he was forbidden or told by Yahweh, given a commandment back here in, in, up here in the most holy place, um, that he could eat of every tree in the garden except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, Yahweh, well then... Satan, while they were in this heavenly state, this pure state of, uh, well, they were experiencing Yahweh's true lover. They were, they were blanketed, covered within Yahweh's love here. That's all they knew was Yahweh's love. Innocent. They were innocent of my heart and mind. Um, Lucifer appeared to Eve at the tree and basically, he told her a lie or, or hoodwinked her into consuming of that fruit that Yahweh had forbidden them to eat. Okay? Um, and then she, in turn, went to Adam, and he, seeing what Eve had done, willingly ate of that fruit. Just as Yash, and, and, and so he died willingly for his bride. Um, because of 
Lucifer's deception uh, to Adam and Eve. Um, let's go ahead and get that where he curses the serpent. Genesis 3 and 1. Is that it, maybe? Genesis 3 and 1 is talks about how the serpent was more subtle. Okay, no, that's, well, we know that. And this is a beast of the field, too. So, you know, in a manner of speaking, but not true beast. But anyway, still, he was smarter than, than Adam and Eve. He had it all over them. They were no match for him, Eve especially. Um, maybe it's 17 and 19, Genesis? Oh, okay, 314. Listen. <laughs> Battery died. Three and fourteen. Three and fourteen. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, mm -hmm. and above every beast of the field. Mm -hmm. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, mm -hmm. and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Okay. So he put uh, he put a curse on, on the Adam or uh, on the serpent. I'm sorry. Um, he put this curse on on the serpent for his deception and causing that death of Adam and Eve, um, that spiritual death. So the blood of Adam is put on the serpent for his, for his deception. Um, he, Adam is told by Yahweh Elohim that he is going to have to work in the field by the sweat of his face and that thorns and thistles, and you can see up here he's, he, he's clean shaven here. But down here, he's got that, that gnarly old beard there going, like thorns and thistles. Um, and that through childbearing, let's get that, Genesis 3 and 15. Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, uh -huh. and between thy seed and her seed. Mm -hmm. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. Okay, that wasn't what I wanted, but that's okay. 16, unto the woman, he said, I go. will greatly multiply thy sorrow, uh -huh. And thy conception. Okay. In sorrow shalt thou, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, mm -hmm. and thy desire shall be to thy husband, okay. and he shall rule over thee. All right. So he's going to have to work by a sweat of his face. In in sorrow, she's going to, to conceive and bear children, which is she'll be sweating too. So there's there's a blood, or yeah, blood water, and then of course for their transgression, the angel Michael drove the man from the garden and the woman followed and then two cherubims and that flaming sword were placed um, put in place so that no one could get back in back up here into the most holy place um, so you've got the blood of Adam and actually um, he was also given the commission by by Yahweh both of them that they were supposed to be fruitful multiply go forth and, and replenish the earth or fill the earth so you've got his, his progeny or his blood going to the four corners of the earth and the blood of his death is on the serpent. Um, the water would be him working by the sweat of his face. The spirit line is Angel Michael. And then the 40 would be the 40 days that Abraham here, because this is all a vision. Everything you see here is a vision that was given to Abraham, or Moses, I'm sorry, not Abraham, Moses. Um, Moses' second trip up into the mountain, his first 40-day trip, but his second principal trip, um, the first seven days he saw creation, or six days he saw the creation and Adam and Eve um, created on the sixth day, and then the seventh day Yahweh Elohim rested. And then he was up there for 40 days, so the next 33 days while Adam and Eve are at rest, Yahweh Elohim is giving Moses a vision of the tabernacle and how it is to be built and all the functions and operations that go on within that tabernacle. Then Moses comes down for 40 days and after 40 days he goes back up with the new, table, new tables of stone and he's given a recapitulation of this seven days of uh, creation. And then on the eighth day he sees Adam and Eve come out of their state of rest 
So for that 40 days, you've got 33 days that they're at rest in the first vision and seven days they're at rest in the second trip. Still the same vision, but second trip into the mountain. So that's your 40. 33 plus 7 is 40. So 40 days, Adam and Eve are at rest in the vision of Moses. <sighs> in the uh, Noah preparing and entering the ark, Yahweh um, sent his angel to Noah to give him divine specifications on how to build the ark. He, he told Noah that he had 120 years. Um, let's get that. Uh, 6 and 3, Genesis 6 and 3. Genesis 6 and 3. And Yahweh said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, uh -huh. for that he also is flesh. Yep. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Okay, so right there, Yahweh numbered the days um, that man had left on the face of the earth at that time. It was 120 years. And for 120 years, Noah preached to the people. Um, let's get that. Warning them of the flood and, and that they should change their ways because, because their hearts were evil continually back here. They did nothing but praise themselves instead of where true praise should go, and that's the Yahweh Elohim. So let's get uh, Ezekiel 33, 4 through 6, please. Ezekiel 33 and 4. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. Okay, so whoever hears the warning and doesn't take heed of that warning, the blood is upon his own head. Go on. Fifth verse. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, mm -hmm. but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. Okay, so if you heard the warning and, and you took heed of that, you, you're going to deliver your soul, which is what Noah did. Noah himself took heed of that warning. Okay, go on. Sixth verse, but if the watchmen see the sword come. Now, Yahweh telling Noah that he had 120 years or that mankind had 120 years, that made him the watchman. Go on. And blow not the trumpet. So if, Yah, if he had not warned the people of the wicked people. And the people be not warned. Uh -huh. If the sword come and okay. take any person from among them, he, uh, he is taken away in his iniquity. Mm -hmm. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Okay, so it's up to the watchman to warn the people. If he doesn't warn the people and it comes, they're still going to be dead in their iniquity, but their blood is going to be on his head or his hands. But he did his job. He preached for 120 years. And that got the blood um, off the head of him. And actually the, the people put the blood upon themselves for not heeding that warning. Um, okay, and so, and then the flood came. Genesis 7 and 16. Mm -hmm. as Elohim had commanded him, and Yahweh shut him in. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so you've got the blood of the people on their own head. You have the, the flood where Yahweh closed the door, and then you have the spirit line, which is, uh, and of course it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. So you've got blood here. Um, water would be the flood. The spirit would be the angel of Yahweh giving Noah the divine specifications for building the ark and Yahweh closing that door of the ark and then the 40 days and nights that it rained. Um, in the birth of Isaac, or I'm sorry, Abraham and King Melchizedek plate, you, we, uh, Yahweh um, was testing Abraham's faith. He came to Abraham in a vision and told Abraham to take Isaac, his, his only son, and take him a three days journey to a mountain that he would point out to him where he was to sacrifice Isaac. Okay? So Abraham made this three day journey to uh, Mount Moriah? Was it Mount Moriah? Okay. 
um, made a three days journey to Mount Moriah, wherein he uh, put, the, put the makings for this altar. Isaac carried those makings up the, up the hill, the wood and everything that was, that was there. Um, and then they built the altar, and on the way up, Isaac asked, let's, let's go ahead and get that. Somewhere in 22, Hebrew. Genesis 22 and 7. Oh, yeah, you're right on it. Good. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, mm -hmm. my son. Uh -huh. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, mm -hmm. but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? So where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Go on. And Abraham said, My son, Yahweh will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Yahweh will provide himself a lamb. Now, this was the lamb that Yahweh provided himself. Right back here. Because it wasn't, Isaac was not to be sacrificed. It wasn't, well, I'll just leave it at that. Um, pardon? <laughs> um, so, just before, and so... You've got, uh, well, so then Isaac, Isaac allowed himself to be put on that altar. You know, 25 years old, 100 years old, you know, he could have put the tea berry shuffle on, uh, on his dad and got away from him and not said, oh, no, 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 if you catch me, you can put me on there. But no, that's not what happened. He willingly sacrificed himself or allowed himself to be tied up and put on that altar. Just as Yahshua, the Messiah, willingly allowed himself to be put on that altar. Um, and again, Isaac's just a type and shadow. Um, so just as Moses was about, Abraham, I'm sorry, Abraham was about to put the knife to his son, the angel appeared, called to him, and he, let's go ahead and get that. Twelfth verse. Oh, start at 11. Uh -huh. And the angel of Yahweh called unto him out of heaven and okay. said, Abraham, Abraham. Mm -hmm. And he said, here am I. Yep. 12 verse. And he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, mm -hmm. neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest Yahweh, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from mm -hmm. me. Okay, so Abraham, being a type and shadow of Yahweh, he did not withhold his son, just as Yahweh did not withhold his son for coming down and offering himself up, or being offered up. Uh, offering himself up, because that's what he did. He offered himself up, right? So then, go ahead. Is there something about the ram there? 13th verse, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram. Okay caught in a thicket by uh -huh. his horns. Okay, so this ram, which is symbolical of Yahshua the Messiah, a ram, the ram being a full-grown lamb, right? Just as Yahshua was a full-grown man when he came in. Um, this ram here was caught in the thicket by his horns. Yahshua here, the Messiah, to fulfill, was caught in that between the law and the testimony showing that he would have to come in and fulfill everything that was written about him in the law and the testimony. So you've got the blood of the ram that was offered up in place of Isaac. You've got the water where Isaac was, was sweating from carrying the wood, or the wood and the fire up the mountainside and also facing impending death. And then the spirit is the angel of Yahweh calling to Abraham and um, basically stopping him from sacrificing Isaac. And then the 40 would be that Ishmael was 40 years old at the time Isaac was to be sacrificed at the age of 25. In the migratory pattern, we have... Um, let's go to Exodus 12. Exodus 12 and 1. And Yahweh spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, Okay. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. All right, so now he's telling Moses, or yeah, Moses and Aaron that this is going to be the beginning of months for you, or the start of the year. It shall be the first month of the year to uh -huh. you. 
Okay. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, mm -hmm. they shall take to them every man a lamb. Okay, so on the tenth day of the month of Abib, they're supposed to take out a lamb. Go on. According to the house of their fathers, a mm -hmm. lamb for a house. Okay, a lamb for a house. So, go on. And if the household be too little for the lamb, right. let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Okay, so depending on the size of your family, maybe you were going to share that lamb with your next door neighbor. Maybe your family was large enough you could consume that lamb all by yourselves. Either way, go on. Every man according to his eating shall mm -hmm. make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Okay. A male of the first year. A male year. of the first year. You right. shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Okay. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. Okay, so they're supposed to take out this lamb either from the sheep or from the goats because that particular word lamb, and I'm sorry, I don't remember what word or what number it is, but that particular word there means member of the flock. Okay. So they're supposed to take out a member of the flock, be it from the sheep or from the goats. They're supposed to hold it over for 10 days, examine it. They're going to shear it, cut all its hair off, make sure it is without spot or blemish, no broken bones. Pardon? Yeah, I'm going to hold it over for four days. Thank you. Almost forgot that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go on. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and uh -huh. the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Okay, so there's one killing going on. Many, many lambs, but they all point to Yahshua the Messiah. It's basically just one lamb that is being slain, because that's all that is slain right here is one lamb. And you have just one lamb being slain back here from the foundation of from the foundation of the world, him being the first of all creation. Okay. Seventh verse, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts. Okay, so now they're supposed to take that blood after they've slayed that lamb, and they're supposed to strike it on the two side posts. And on the upper door post of and the on houses. on the upper door post. Of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Uh-huh. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, mm -hmm. and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Okay, so read that little bit over again. They and, shall. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, uh -huh. roast with fire. And they're going to roast that lamb with fire. Um, Yahshua, being on the cross back here, was roasted by all the people surrounding him. Okay. And unleavened bread. Uh-huh, because he hadn't risen yet. That's why he had, they had to eat unleavened bread here, because Yahshua had not risen yet. Go on. And with bitter herbs, and they shall eat herbs, it. bitter herbs, because he was going to die a very bitter death. And also to remind them of the bitter bondage that they had down here in Egypt. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden it all with water, mm -hmm. but roast with fire. Roast with fire his head with his legs, mm -hmm. and with the pertinence thereof. Mm -hmm. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. Uh -huh. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. Okay. Now they had to, to burn it all because when Yahshua here rose, there was nothing left. When they went into that tomb, there was no body there. It had been consumed. Go on. And thus shalt ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, mm -hmm. and you shall eat it in haste. Mm -hmm. It is Yahweh's Passover. Okay, this is, the, this, is, this is the Passover. Okay, everything after that was just a memorial of what happened down here on that night. Okay, so what they were supposed to do is take the blood of that lamb and put it on the four points of the door. After they did that, then the death angel, or angel of death, came along, because this was going to spare the firstborn um, of all man and creature in your household, right? So you had the firstborn of all the Egyptians dying back here, and of course that, that, was, that was pretty chaotic. Well, actually, it was all in chaos. Um, 
So after that death, Pharaoh finally had enough and says, okay, Moses, pack up your kids, your stuff, and get out of here. We can't take this anymore. Of course, he did end up having to change of heart again. Yahweh re-hardened his heart one more time. <laughs> and so then the children of Israel, because this took place before the Exodus, then the children made a three-day journey to and through the Red Sea. Um, they... they which is at 2,300 days because you've got two days, um, the 14th and the 15th, where they made that journey. And then early in the morning on the 16th, they started passing through that divided waters of the Red Sea. Um, and then Pharaoh and his host pursued after them. <sighs> Get me 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. First Corinthians 10 and 1. Moreover, brethren, mm -hmm. I would not that ye should be ignorant mm -hmm. how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Okay, now this is Paul speaking or writing to the Corinthians there. And he's telling them, now don't be ignorant of this fact. Don't be stupid, boys. All of our, all of our parents, all of our ancestors passed through this sea. Go on. And were all baptized. Uh huh. And they were all baptized. Unto Moses. Uh huh. In the cloud and in the sea. Okay, so they were all baptized in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. Mm -hmm. Spiritual meat. Mm -hmm. Fourth verse. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. Uh huh. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was the Messiah. Okay, well, that's King James Version, right? They didn't follow. He did not follow them. He led them. Okay? I want to make that perfectly clear that Yahshua is not a follower. All right? <laughs> and that was that angel in that cloud was Yahshua the Messiah. So you, and uh, of course, then they passed up into the wilderness where they were um, led by that cloud for 40 years. So you've got the blood of the lamb put on the four points of the door. You've got the water from the parting of the Red Sea, um, and then the Spirit, which is the angel of Yahweh or Yahshua, the Messiah, um, as Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh, and that would be Yahshua, the Messiah. And he led them through that divided waters of the Red Sea into the wilderness where they were there for 40 years. Now in the interior pattern here, we have sacrifices that were brought daily um, in place of sinners who were under the penalty of death. And that blood had to be put upon the four horns of this, this brazen altar of sin sacrifice. Um, after the, the sacrifice or the, the, the creature was brought here and killed, they would, they would prepare that sacrifice and then wash it in the laver um, and then put it on the altar to be, to be consumed. The priest, after performing all these functions, he himself would then also wash in that labor and have to change his linen um, before, and then he, um, before he could go into the, most, or into the holy place. And then he would rise up with the blood of that sacrifice into the holy place um, for, the, for the sinner. And that, would be, that blood would be put uh, upon the four horns of there of the altar of uh, incense. So um, you've got the blood of the sacrifice here. You have the water in the laver. Um, the spirit which um, at the age of 30 the high priest was anointed with this holy cup of anointing oil um, which the oil representing the spirit and the oil being poured upon out upon that high priest would represent him being a quickening spirit or that he has been quickened. And then he could rise up into that holy place to perform his functions. And this happened at the door, which if you go back over here to the uh, tabernacle pattern, you can see that the door was a fourth step in this, in this pattern. You also have um, the oil that was poured into this golden lampstand was poured 
in the main branch or the fourth branch, showing that that fourth branch is Yahshua the Messiah, and that oil would all raise up together in each branch, showing that Yahshua was going to raise everybody up on this side of the law and raise up everybody on the new side of the law, if I could put it like that. You also had four corners on the table of shoe bread, thank you. And then, of course, there were four main ingredients also in the incense that was burned on the altar of incense. Where was I? Oh, okay, back here. Um, let's get John 1 and 29. This is the baptism and ministry plate of Yahshua the Messiah. John 1, 29. The next day John seeth Yahshua coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of Yahweh. Mm -hmm which taketh away the sin of the world. Okay. So right there, John's declaring Yahshua to be the Lamb of Yahweh that would come in and die for the sin of the world. And so it was his blood that was going to have to be spilled. Okay. Um, pardon? That's right. Yes. It was his blood that would be spilled for the salvation of man. Not these bulls and goats back here because they didn't do anything. Um, uh, yeah, right here. Um, let's get John 1 and 32. John 1, 32. And John bare a record saying, mm -hmm. I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, okay. and it abode upon him. 33. Right. Oh, hold on a second. No, you can stop there. But what I would like is if you could find it where it talks about Yahshua coming to John to be baptized. Because this is a three-day journey that Yahshua had made. This is, you know, um, this would be during the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? Because he had just spent that Passover with his, with his parents, right? And then he made a three-day journey to John to be baptized mm -hmm. in the River Jordan at the same exact spot that Joshua, who was Yahshua, crossed that River Jordan, Okay and planted them 12 stones in that river. Go on. Matthew 3.13. Then cometh Yahshua from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Mm -hmm. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Okay. So Yahshua, after three days, just as the children here of Israel, because these are our two patterns that we go by, the interior pattern and the migratory pattern. These are basic, your basic templates for everything that has happened because you've got blood, water, spirit, um, and you've got blood and water and spirit. These children here, after making that sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb, had to make a three-day journey to, to the divided waters of the Red Sea, and that's where they were baptized in that Red Sea. Yahshua had to make that same three-day journey because that's part of him that's fulfilling. That's what he came to do, was fulfill. So, and then, uh, you, well, read Acts 10 and 44 again. Oh, okay. we didn't read it at all, so let's read Acts 10 and 44. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Acts 10, 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word. Okay. So as John here, um, he was told by Yahweh that when he sees the Spirit descend and abode upon him that he baptizes, that is who the Savior will be. That's, that's the, the Messiah, the one that was prophesied about all through the law and the prophets. Okay? And so John saw that spirit. Let's go ahead and read that again. John 1 and 32. John 1, 32. And John bare record, saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, mm -hmm. and it abode upon him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so John saw that spirit abode upon Yahshua, and he had no idea prior to that moment other than his cousin, who Yahshua actually was. Okay? And then the next day, John sees Yahshua coming. And let's go ahead and read that again. John 1 and 29. John 1, 29. 
The next day, John seeth Yahshua coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of Yahweh, which taketh away the sin of the world. Okay. So we have the blood, um, John declaring Yahshua to be the Lamb of Yahweh and that it would be his blood that would be spilt for the remission of our sins. You have Yahshua being baptized by John in the River Jordan three days after the Passover, just as the children back here were. And then you have the Spirit descending upon Yahshua in the likeness of a dove. And then the Spirit, is that is it? No, that wouldn't be that. Matthew, Any, huh? Matthew 4 and 1. Okay. Then was, ya then was Yahshua led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Okay. And so then the Spirit led to Yahshua where he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to be tempted by Satan and he did not sin. In the unity of the Spirit, let's get John, 1 John 5, 7 through 8. Might as well start at 6. 1 John 5 and 6. This is he that came by water and blood. Okay, now this is he who came by water and blood. Even Yash the Messiah. Uh-huh. Not by water only. Nope. But by water and, and blood. blood. Right. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness. Okay. Because the Spirit is truth. The Spirit is truth. Go on. For there are three that bear record in heaven. Now we have three that bear record in heaven. The Father. The Father. The Word. Uh-huh. And the Holy Spirit. Okay. And these three are one. And these three are one. They are all the same deity. Okay? There is no separation. They're not God and his two little boys, you know, if I can put it that way. It is Yahweh, Yahweh in, in, fa in the Father as pure spirit. That is how Yahweh exists in his true state, if I could put it like that. Is his pure spirit. And then he came down in the, the, the super incorporeal form as Elohim. And you can see here that um, because man could not conceive of what pure spirit is. You've you just got no concept. You can't wrap your mind around it. None of that. So for Yahweh to communicate, so to speak, he came down. He lessened himself into a lesser shape and form but it's still a super incorporeal form, um, which could only be seen in visions, okay? And, that, and it says here, manifested in visions to Moses, John, and the prophets, okay? And also seen at the transfiguration by Peter, James, and John, which that happened before his crucifixion, correct? Is that right? The transfiguration? Right. Um, and then... He came down, Yahweh came down into physical, concrete form as Yahshua the Messiah, which uh, says Yahshua, the physical form of Yahweh, manifested in the flesh as Yahshua and the material creation. Okay? Go on. And there are three that bear witness in earth, mm -hmm. the spirit and the water and the blood. Uh-huh. And these three agree in one. Okay. And these three agree. Is the spirit, well, the blood, the water, and the spirit. It says, read that part over again. And there are three that bear witness in earth. In the earth. The Yahshua, spirit, the Messiah, is the earth. That's the, who these, these witnesses are in, is Yahshua, the Messiah. Go on. The spirit, and mm -hmm. the water, and the blood. Mm -hmm. And these three agree in one. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so for 40 centuries or 4,000 years that these three witnesses, the blood, the water, and the spirit, testified or witnessed to Yahshua's death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? And with that, I will say all praises go to Yahshua the Messiah. Hallelujah. Who would you like? Do you have some? Our next speaker for this evening will be Dr. Christopher Jackson.
he's back on. <laughs> Good evening. I enjoyed the previous speaker, and uh, uh, I didn't. I caught uh, probably about three quarters of what he was talking about, but uh, I got a gist of what he was talking about. And uh, and I see he strategically laid this thing out. Uh, this elementary chart here that Yahshua, or that Yahweh gave a man named Dr. Henry C. Kenley a vision to give to us. And uh, this is the, the chart that, uh, you know, if you went, ever went to elementary, you know you got to start in kindergarten. And so this is a simple method uh, of where we can learn something about Yahweh Elohim. And he talked about those blood lines, and he talked about those spirit lines, and the water line. And all of that did point, and, and, and uh, truly do point up to Yahshua Messiah. Because you do get the blood, the water, and the spirit within Yahweh Elohim that died on the cross. And uh, since he started on that elementary chart, I guess I just want to uh, probably start right here, where Yahweh came out of uh, existence right here. Because Yahweh right here, you cannot understand him. Uh, so he broke himself down, as the previous speaker said, to... Uh, uh, Elohistic body, body right here, or this uh, 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 or this Elohistic body where he transformed himself into so that we can understand something about him. Not totally, but you have to have a vision or understand, and an understanding to recognize this one. And he further broke himself down to Yahshua the Messiah so that we could uh, see him with our own eyes, feel him with our own hands, and listen to him with our own ears. And so that we didn't have to uh, 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 you know, try to pull things out of our mind to understand something about Yahweh Elohim. Right sing, sing, I'll go over sing, here to this chart. To this form uh, in the flesh right here, that gave us opportunity to accept him or reject him. And that is in the uh, scriptures, if we can get that. Accept him or reject him. And uh, so... A lot of people in the world, like back here, he called these people wicked because they did not accept him. That Noah preached for 120 years. And I can imagine some people fell off, uh, not believing anymore, started off believing, and, they, and then they end up not believing. That died too, that believed. And uh, the one and the previous speaker did uh, diligently tell you that you know Noah preached that gospel for 120 years, and and he was he definitely did the work that he, Yahweh asked him to do is to preach this gospel. And these people, which Put, which took the blood right off of uh, Noah's head and it put it on the people's head uh, because they did not accept. Now, can we get that uh, scripture that I had out? One in, um, 12, 47 and 8. 12, 47 and 8. If any man, Sorry. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Right. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. And who that one. rejected him 
and receive not his word, which is this gospel, that the same gospel that we're preaching right here today. Read. Hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Right. So the same word that he spoke is the same word is going to judge us, which is this gospel that Yahshua died on the cross all about. Is to give us the gospel so that we can have eternal life. Now as a father, you know, I'm a father, and there's and it's a couple of fathers in here. And, uh, and if you, from a natural standpoint, we have to take the natural to understand the spirit. We can take our own lives to understand some about Yahweh. And so from a natural standpoint, I'm a father. And if I'm a father that uh, uh, just neglect my kids, let them do anything, don't try to teach them nothing. You know, what kind of father am I? You know, I'm a father like that guy right there of lies. You know, Lucifer. He's the one that don't care about children. Yahweh is the one that cares about all of us. Even the, even the beasts out there in the field, he cares about them. But they all got a job to do. But Yahweh also gave, he gave mankind this vision and revelation so that we can understand something about this gospel. And without that Without him coming out of this pure spirit state into this embodiment or uh, in this elohistic state or this panoramic vision state and also into this physical state, we wouldn't have never knew nothing. So, so I, am so, I am so pleased that Yahweh came out of this state into this state, and then also into this physical state. Um, and, and that's why we're able to uh, say something that's uh, edifying uh, to the world about this eternal life because a lot of people really don't believe in eternal life. And I'm here to tell you that eternal life do exist because we know we are going to die one day. And we also think that we're going to resurrect into heaven if we have the Heavenly Father in us. Just from a natural standpoint, we think that, that we're going to go to heaven after we, when we die. And if you're bad, you're going to hell. Well... If you accept this gospel, you're going to heaven. And if you don't accept this gospel, you're going to hell. It's simple as that. It's simple as that. That's how Yahweh laid it out. It ain't about you being bad or good. Uh, bad or good in the natural. You know, uh, chase women, uh, shoot pool, shoot dice, shoot people. You know, uh, it ain't a, you know, if you accept Yahshua Messiah in your life, Guess what? You won't be doing all of that no way. But, you know, if you accept Yahshua in your life, that's what you're going to have is eternal life. And that's what I want. And that, I know that's what the world want, but the world don't want to be humble enough and come in and accept uh, the gospel of Yahshua Messiah or the vision that, the, that, that he gave this man in 1931. The same vision that he gave Moses in 1490. And the same vision that he gave John on the island of Patmos in A.D. 96. The same vision he, he preaching. The same one. So that, that should tell you, I mean, if you believe anything in the Bible, if Moses seen it from the beginning, or Moses seen it from the, from the beginning and John seen it from the, from the ending, uh, and then he gave it to Dr. Henry C. Kelly uh, for this age that we're living in so that we can accept it and also have eternal life. And if we don't accept it, we will not have eternal life. It's just simple as that. One, two, three. 
Uh, he laid it out so simple. You know, uh, the blood. Blood, sim uh, if you, when you think about blood, you think about death. Or when you see blood, you say somebody is hurt or dead. Especially if you see a lot of blood, you will say somebody is hurt or dead. And uh, Mr. McNamara strategically, like I said, went through this and broke it all the way down. And I'm glad he was first because I can just come up behind him and say a little bit because that's all I got anyway. And but anyway, that blood symbolized death. When you see blood, you think about death. When you see water, you think about burial or, you know, you think of, when you say baptized, you think about water. You know, but you know this blood was simple, symbolized uh, the blood of Yahshua that he gave up. Not this blood that the serpent took from Adam, but the blood that Yahshua gave up. That's what, we all, that's what we're talking about. And the water wasn't that the water on Adam's face is going to save our life. The, the baptism that, Yah, that John baptized Yahshua in is what, what saved our life. Part of that, if you, if you believe you was baptized with him, just like Mr. Mac, McNamara said, you're baptized with Yahshua. If you're believing, you're baptized with him. And, you, and if you're believing, you're going to resurrect with him. And that's how we're able to preach this gospel because we rose with Yahshua. And we got this gospel in us. So we're able to preach it. And the, uh, the, the blood symbolized death. The water always symbolized a burial or a baptism. And uh, the spirit, and the spirit, pardon me, symbolized the resurrection. Thank you, I had a man blink. And uh, symbolized the resurrection. Not the resurrection of this child uh, that uh, was conceived by Eve, showing that spirit of that baby coming out of that womb, or it, it showed forth Yahshua, the real spirit, shows forth Yahshua giving up the ghost, or him giving up that spirit and, and pouring it out into our hearts and minds. That's what it all means. It ain't about what Adam did. It's about what Adam is doing to point to Yahshua to show us something. And it's about what uh, these people, uh, the blood was on their head because they didn't listen to the gospel. Well, it, it didn't help them people back there, but it's helping us because we can pour this off the chart and, and understand something about accepting or rejecting. You're going to hell if you don't accept. You're going to heaven if you accept. Now, which one would you rather do? I'd rather accept. And that's what these people did not do. And you see little red marks around their head because they're going to hell. They're going to hell. They did not accept. And uh, right, uh, uh, the, the, uh, and this, uh, the water where they was... Uh, Drowned and, and busted asunder, that water is only showing forth this true burial or this true baptism that Yahshua went through. And this ark of safety where the people should have got in, where they didn't get in, this ain't what's saving us. What's saving us is Yahshua the Messiah. Because these people did not listen and they did not get in the ark. Well, we got a chance to get in the ark. We see these people was ignorant and did not do it and didn't get in the ark. Well, down here, we can take this off the, and learn from their experience. That's in the Bible, too. You know, this is for our ammunition, you know. And so when Yahshua died on the, this is the true ark, being, believing in him and, and being saved with him, this is the true ark of safety right here for this age. For the world, it's enough room for everybody. So it's, you got a chance to accept because it ain't going to last but a little while longer. 
So come on into the ark. Come on into the knowledge and understanding of Yahshua, which is the ark. It ain't no wooden ark. It ain't this building. It's being in Yahshua the Messiah. It's being in Yahshua. This is the only place to be. Where else can you be? Everything is so corrupt. The world is corrupt, folks. The world is corrupt. And I don't want to be stuck in the world believing on money, believing on the house that I got, the car that I got. They ain't going to save me. Those tools is not going to save me. What's going to save me eternally is Yahshua Messiah or this gospel. This gospel is Yahshua. This is, I'm so glad that we on this Ustream thing because we get to tell the world now. We get to tell the world. And I'm not afraid uh, to, to preach this gospel because what, I, what Yahshua gave me to say, I'm going to say it in a, in a good heart and in a humble voice, hopefully, and not be so mean about it and so mad at this world about deceiving me the time that I was deceived. You know, but Yahshua, he is my hope and my glory and my salvation. This is the, this is the one that we need to be in. Not this one on the picture. That ain't Yahshua. It's the only example. We got to show some example to, to understand. And so that's why we got these charts. We, we break the Bible down in pictorial form. You know, the, this is all the Bible in pictorial form. You know, just right here where uh, Isaac uh, killed, uh, I mean, uh, well, let's get it. Uh, where... Uh, yeah, Genesis 22, 1 through 14. And this is where Abraham, being a type of Yahshua the Messiah, and Isaac being a type of Yahshua. So this is like Yahweh and Yahshua right here. This is just like it. Just like it. Read. Oh, uh, Genesis. Genesis, starting at 22 and 1. Yes. And it came to pass after these things that Yahweh did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. Mm -hmm. And he said, Take now. Now that's son. Yahweh talking to Abraham. And Abraham said, Here I am. Read. Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac. Now take your son, your only son. Now I got a son. And I got a son here. Now Yahweh tell me to take my son. Read. Take thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. Whom and I thee. love. Whom, Yah, whom Abraham loved very deeply. If you are mother or father and get children or even grandchildren, you know how that felt. We can relate to that. Read. And get thee into the land of Moriah. Okay. And offer him there for a burnt offer offering. Offer your son for a burnt offering. Man, I'd be, you know, okay, if I, I want to say if it was me, I would have been like, come on, y'all, we don't let make me kill my butt. Being obedient. Abraham being obedient to the father. And as we're going to read later, you're going to see Isaac being obedient to his 90-year-old father. And he's 25, 125, and, and then we got a 25-year-old. Read. For a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Okay. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and Abraham got up ass, early in the morning. And took two of his young men with him. And took two of his young men with him. And Isaac I don't know if his these son, young men was uh, some associates or... Uh, Servants. 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 Some of his servants. Okay. He needed, because he thinking he probably going to have to chase Isaac down, probably, at the end, because he, he going to take him up there to, after, to uh, sacrifice him. This man is 25 years old. Corey, come back here. Now, see, Corey, so, Corey is bigger than me, but he can't take me. No, yes, he can, because he, <laughs> he's younger than I. He, I'll be out of breath. You know, so I'm only comparing... Uh, Abraham and Isaac, and I'm using my son and myself to demonstrate that. Read, please. 
And Abraham rose up early in the morning and Abraham saddled his ass. Abraham rose up early in the morning, okay. And took two of his young men with okay. him. And Isaac his son. Okay. And clave the wood for the burnt offering. Okay. And rose up and went unto the place which Yahweh had told him. Mm -hmm. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Okay. Abraham looked up and seen the place where he supposed to sacrifice his son. Read. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship mm -hmm. and come again to you. Mm -hmm. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. Right. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, mm -hmm. and they went both of them together. Mm -hmm. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the I, fire. I'm just about understand what Isaac about. Now, wait a minute. Where's the sacrifice? And who's going to be getting burnt on this thing? Now, tell me now. Because uh, Isaac might try to fight his dad. I don't know if well Abraham is being obedient. So in the in the uh, in the situation, Yahweh got it covered. He gonna he gonna make sure Isaac gonna be obedient, cause it's gonna point to Yahshua down here at the cross where he's gonna be obedient to the world to or to Yahweh and die diligently on that cross because he know he is gonna give us eternal life. Mm -hmm. He love us. He's talking about it way back here, way back here, and we way up here. He did this way back here for all of us up here, plus all the people that was before for us. That's a powerful thing. That's a powerful thing. Yahweh is so powerful, and, it, and he's just breaking it down in little one, two, three uh, secrements for us. It's, and it's just, it's just so simple. And if the world is listening, come on in and get some of this because it's going to be eternal life to you. You ain't going to be here forever. Is there any more left there, Gross? Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Mm -hmm. And Abraham said, my son. He asked him, where's the, where's the wood for the burnt offering? Read. And Abraham said, my son, Yahweh will provide himself a lamb you for say, a burnt Okay, offering. my son, you know, Yahweh going to provide himself a sacrifice, whether it's you or this ram here that's caught in the thickets. Read. So they went both of them together. Both of them went together. And they came to the place which Yahweh had told him of. Mm -hmm. And Abraham, now Isaac is walking diligent with his, with his father. Just as meek as Joshua did when he walked to that cross. This is meek. Read. And Abraham built an altar there. Mm -hmm. And laid the wood in order mm -hmm. and bound Isaac, his Isaac son. Isaac is looking at this, and then he bound his son to this, to this altar here. Read. And laid him on the altar. And laid the him wood. on the offer, altar. He did not fight. Laid him on there. 25 years old. This man is 125. Laid his son there. Laid him on there. Read. And Abraham stretched forth his hand. Abraham stretched forth his hand. And took the with knife. With this big old knife in his hand. Stretched it out like this. We're getting ready to slay his son. Read. And took the knife to slay his son. Yes. And the angel of Yahweh. And the angel of Yahweh. See that Yahweh got him covered. And he got us covered. He got us covered. This, this really happened, folks. This really happened. And the angel stayed, saved his hand and. And the angel of Yahweh called unto him out of heaven and said, The Abraham, angel of Yahweh called to Abraham out of heaven. Out of heaven. This is heaven right here, folks. We don't understand it. This is divine intelligence. Divine wisdom. We cannot go to Michigan State and get this. This is where knowledge came from. This is where Michigan State copycat from. This is where the world copycat. Talking about they get intelligence and wisdom and smartness. This is where they get it from right here. We only a type a little bit. Any more there, uh, Gross? And and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. 
said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. Twelve verse. He just, Abraham got so much faith, he probably reading what's going on because he got so much faith in Yahweh. Read. And he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad. Lay not your hand upon that lad. Read. Neither do thou anything unto him. Neither do you do anything to him. Now this is the angel of Yahweh talking to him. Read. For now I know that thou fearest Yahweh. For now I know you fear Yahweh. Read. Seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, that's why I fear Yahweh. I'm not ashamed to say it. I fear him because he loved me and I know he will spank me. And if, with that, I hope somebody got something out of it. Thank you, Dr. Jack. Whoops. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Our next speaker for this evening will be Dr. Danielle Anwar. Thank you. I have enjoyed the um, words of the previous speakers. Chris, you could have kept going. I was, <laughs> I was feeling it. But um, yeah, this is a school and it's not a church like they were saying. Um, I'm gonna just continue with the same train of thought. <clears throat> so Moses is called up here into the mount. He sees Elohim, who is the archetype, original pattern of the universe. And then he sees the tabernacle pattern, intangible. Then he sees Elohim. And I've been going through these days of creation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the three days of creation, if time permits, and I'm going to correlate them to the migratory pattern and then also to the tabernacle pattern to show Yahshua the Messiah. So I'm going to come back here um, to do this. Yeah, no problem. So, <laughs> the last time I went through Theosophy, Godhead, Cosmogony, Chaosis. So here you've got the first day, the second day, and the third day. The first day is light and darkness and twilight. The second day is the waters being divided. And the third day is the resurrection or the vegetation. So you have a death, a burial, and the resurrection. Then what Yahweh Elohim does is he just repeats another death, burial, and resurrection. Now what happens is the first three days are the structure. Just like in the tabernacle pattern, you have the structure. The second three days end up being the function. The fourth, the fifth, and the sixth day are the function. What I mean by that is the first day you have light, the fourth day you're filling it in with the celestial bodies. The second day you have the waters being divided and you have the heavens being formed. The fifth day you're filling the heavens and you're filling the earth. So you have the structure, the function, the structure, the function. The third day, which is the vegetation, ends up being the structure for the function, which is the sixth day, sixth day, the beast of the field, and man. And if you notice, there's a symbiotic relationship between the vegetation and between man. Man gives off carbon dioxide and oxygen comes off of these plants. So there's a symbiotic exchange. So Yahweh is doing everything by the tabernacle pattern, which is gonna point to Yahshua the Messiah or Yahweh Elohim. 
Now, if you take the first day, you have light, you have a semi-light or a twilight, and you have an evening. Now, I'm going to take this and I'm going to correlate it directly to the tabernacle pattern so you can see Yahweh Elohim. So the first day here illustrates the division between light and darkness. Can I have Genesis 1 and 1 through 5, and then also 2 Corinthians 4 and 6. Genesis 1 and 1 through 5. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, Yahweh Elohim created the heavens and the earth. So in the beginning, Elohim is creating the heavens, which was cosmogony, and the earth, chaosis. Read on. And the earth was without form and void. Now the earth was without form and void. Read on. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. Mm -hmm. And the spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. And Elohim said, let there be light. And there was light. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good. And Elohim divided the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day. And the darkness he called night. Okay. So if you come here to the first day, you have the darkness which Elohim called night. So you've got the first night. It's surrounded by the waters, and then the inorganic earth is here at the bottom. Now, inorganic means not living. Like I said, there's a bunch of different definitions and chemistry for it, but inorganic really means to me not living because organic food, the reason why people eat it is because it's alive. It doesn't have pesticides. It's not going to hurt you. It's not going to break your body down. So here you've got this inorganic earth. Inorganic simply means not living. So when you come over here to this inorganic earth and you correlate it directly to the tabernacle pattern, you have one, two, three, four points of blood. In the inorganic earth, you've got four main directions, east, west, north, and south. You come over here, you have a fire that was in the altar of sin sacrifice. You have a fire that is in the core of earth. Here, you've got these graded lines here that go east and west and north and south. Just like here in the earth, you've got lines of longitude and lines of latitude. So this altar of sin sacrifice is directly correlating to this inorganic earth. Now the inorganic earth is surrounded by water. So here, in the tabernacle pattern, you've got the laver and it's filled with water. You come over here and you've got darkness or the first night. So that first night, that water and that earth, here these people are offering these sin sacrifices, these innocent sin sacrifices because they are not in the light, but they are in darkness. So you've got darkness, you've got water, and you've got earth completely correlating to the tabernacle pattern on the first day. Now, when you come through the veil, the division between the court roundabout and the holy place, it says you've got the division between evening and morning. Now here, in the first day, you've got a blue, purple, and scarlet veil which covers the horizon. So this is at sunset or daybreak. You've got blue, purple, and scarlet because over here in the veil, you've got blue, purple, and scarlet. Now you come over here and there's a semi-light or an evening. The spirit moved upon the face of the water. Now within the spirit contains everything. So here in the spirit, just like you come into the holy place, Yahshua says, I am the light of the world. That's that same spirit here that's here. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the true intercessor. That spirit occupying over here is the same thing. It has the same substance that's in the tabernacle. But mainly, there's oil that goes in the middle prong, and it goes up through all the branches, and then it's lit. So there's a semi-light here, and there's a semi-light here. So you've got darkness, you've got a veil, and you've got semi-light here. Now here, it says there's a division between light and darkness. So this is sunset, and at sunset again, you have those blue, purple, and scarlet veils that are in the horizon or in the sunset. Every time you look at a beautiful horizon, you see blue, purple, and scarlet. Why is that? Because it goes according to that tabernacle pattern. 
Now you divide through here, you come into here and you have cosmic light. It's at the command of Yahweh Elohim that darkness is abolished by cosmic light. The same way that Yahweh Elohim can speak in light, the same way he can speak in us. Now Yahweh Elohim doesn't sit here and say, well, maybe there'll be light. He says, let there be light. And that's how we have to speak in ourselves. Let this weight come off this body. Let me pass this grade in school. This same spirit that is abiding within this world is also abiding in man. So here, go to 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, please. 2 Corinthians 4 and 6. Mm -hmm. For Yahweh Elohim, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, mm -hmm. hath shined in our hearts. He's also shined in our hearts. So here you've got light, and this is important because this comes into play later when Yahshua, the Messiah, is crucified. This all comes into play. So a day makes light, twilight, and darkness. Here, light, twilight, and darkness. So the second day illustrates the division between the waters in heaven and the waters covering the face of the deep. So if you go to Genesis 1 and 1 through 6 through 8, please. Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, Yahweh one, Elohim. 1 and 6, I'm sorry. 1 and 6. Yep. And Elohim said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters mm -hmm. and let it divide the waters from the waters. Mm hmm and Elohim made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Mm -hmm. Eighth verse. Mm -hmm. And Elohim called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Okay, so you've got these waters that are beneath the firmament. The firmament is just heaven. So you've got the waters beneath the firmament. Here you've got the division between the waters beneath and the waters covering the face of the deep. What's the face of the deep? It's just the top of the waters. So here, you've got a division between court roundabout and the holy place. And again, here, water is in three states. You've got water in an invisible state here, you've got water in a semi-liquid state here, and you've got the waters beneath the earth being in a more solidified state. So that's like Yahweh being invisible, Elohim being a semi-cloud, and then here in the, in the court roundabout, it's like Yahshua, there's actually water. So here, um, you've got this clouds in, in a semi-liquid form or a semi-liquid state here. So you come over here, and you've got this altar of incense, and on top of that altar in, of incense, there's a cloud. So there's a cloud here, and there's a cloud here. And again, you've got the water covering the inorganic earth, then being separated here, just like the first veil between the holy place and the court roundabout. Now, if you come up here, you've got the firmament, which is called heaven. Now, that's, the firmament is just the heaven. So there's water above the firmament, or the heavens, and then there's water beneath. So here, in the most holy place of the second day, you've got water or moisture in a gaseous substance invisible to the naked eye. Just like over here, when Yahweh abode between the two cherub and he was seen here, well, he wasn't seen because he was invisible. So you've got invisibility here, you've got this water being invisible here. So you've got water or moisture in a gaseous substance, invisible to the naked eye, um, operated in spirit law as reflected in electrical energy, causing lightning to flash. So here you've got that spirit law here, you've got that same Yahweh Elohim or that spirit law here that dwell between the cherubim. Now that Shekinah is gonna flash, that lightning is gonna flash. Just like here, like the previous speaker said, on the Day of Atonement, that lightning would flash in the most holy place to let the children of Israel know that their sins were atoned for. So you've got moisture or, or water or moisture in a gaseous substance, you've got it in a semi-liquid state in the cloud, and you've got in a dense state. He's showing you by the pattern how he goes, how he is Yahweh Elohim. 
So here on the third day, you got the 2300 days, just like Dr. Hudson talks about. You got one, two, here's the 3000th part of the day. So you've got the death, the burial, the resurrection. Now this is the creation of the vegetation. Can I get Genesis 1 and 9? Genesis 1 and 9, and Elham said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Is that it? For nine. Okay. So here in the third day, you've got this. Now Yahweh, Elohim, has Dr. Kinley call it an inorganic. So the inorganic earth is impregnated with an inorganic or lifeless or inanimate substance. No different than a woman having eggs that have not been fertilized. No different than a man that has semen, but it's not. It doesn't come together until he's with a woman. So here you have this inorganic, lifeless, inanimate substance. So what I'm saying is Yahweh Elohim does not drop seeds all over the earth. That would take too long. What he does is he has inorganic or dead substance from which he is going to resurrect this vegetation out of that inorganic or lifeless substance. So here... You've got that. You've got the more dense waters beneath the firmament, which are covering the inorganic substance. And then there's a division here, just like she just read. The dry land is appearing. You've got the water being collect collected into seas or rivers. So there's a division there. And then here, you've got the seed of vegetation being quickened. Just like over here, the high priest was anointed at the door one time at the age of 30, unless it was Aaron and his sons, which were out of the, the appropriate age. But that's OK, because Yahweh has that going according to the pattern as well. So this seed of vegetation is quickened on the third day and being raised that resurrected first fruits. So here you've got the division between the blossom and fruition. It's just like this. You have a flower or a plant. It's like this. It's concealed and then it's revealed. That's it. It's like a blossom fruition. So here he's got it coming out of this inorganic dead substance covered with water. He brings it up, comes into first fruits, goes into the bud, the blossom, and the fruition or the concealing and revealing. Now here in the most holy place, you've got the vegetation unerringly controlled by that spirit law. You got that same spirit law here. You see these hearts, these red hearts going all through the most holy place, going back to Yahweh Elohim, who's here, who's that, that spirit law. And he's unerringly controlling every minute detail of the creation. Yes, there is no free will. I'm sorry, there is no free will. The consciousness allows you to think you have a free will, but there is no free will. Yahshua has dictated or predestined, foreknown every detail. We just don't know. We have to become conscious. And that doesn't mean that you're just like, oh, la, la, la. You come to the consciousness, if you can, that Yahshua is the Messiah, that he did die, bury, resurrect, and ascend for you. But he already knows who that is, and that's proven all through the Law and the Prophets. So here you've got the death, the burial, the resurrection pointing to Yahshua the Messiah. Now when you come over here to Yahshua the Messiah, you've got him dead on the cross. He's got the four points of blood, just like there's four points of blood on the altar. There is a roast back here. They are roasting him on this cross, not only from the sun, but the words that they are using. So he is roasted. Just like there's a fire going back here. There are all types of whip marks on him. Lines of longitude, if you will, and latitude. He is beaten 40 lashes. So you've got that grade work here. It's going completely unerringly according to the pattern. Now it gets dark at, oh, let me do it like this. Let me, cause I gotta do two days real quick cause I wanna show the darkness. At nine o'clock in the morning on Friday, Yahshua is put on the cross. When it's nine o'clock, it's light. From 6 a.m. that morning to nine, it's light. Now remember, a day, it's light. 
Then at noon, it begins to go dark. It actually turns black. Actually, from 9 to 12, it begins to turn dark. That's your twilight, just like that day back here. Okay? Now, from 12 until 3 o'clock, it goes completely dark. Now, that's within a day. So now you've got Yahshua. He's going through this darkness. Okay? And then from 6 because I'm trying to think real quick without writing it on the board. From three to six, it goes back into twilight. Okay? Yes. Light. Ah, right here, right here. Thank you. It goes back into light because at three o'clock, it's light. Thank you. So again, you've got the light. Then it goes back into twilight from six to nine at night because that's your evening. So there's another day like it's a complete it's not just light and darkness. It's a complete like he did light. He did twilight and he did darkness. Then from six or from nine until the next day. And I, 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 I can't write it out. So I'm trying to think quick because I got to hurry up. It goes dark again. So you've got two days and two nights on that Friday, Saturday, the whole day. It's you got a light. You've got a twilight and you've got a darkness. So he's got three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So you've got him dead and you've got him in that darkness. He's buried in Joseph's new tomb, just like that water and that earth was buried, just like there was a burial here. Now you come up here. He is sealed in the tomb. That's like a veil. So when that is rolled away, that's a veil. Him coming out of there. There is your second or your first veil. Then he comes up and he resurrects the first fruits out of all of them that raised, which is in Matthew, the 27th chapter. So then he comes up here. He resurrects. There's another veil because he takes off the veil of flesh, which is what Dr. McNamara was talking about, that carnal, that flesh that has to be resurrected in you. Now he ascends into heaven one time for everybody. That is the complete cycle. And it also goes by the migratory pattern, which is that one, two, three, four points of blood, one, two, three, four points of blood. You've got that water here, that burial here. You've got that uh, 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 spirit here being leading them throughout the Red Sea. So you've got the blood, the water, the spirit. You've got the light, the bread, the intercession here, because here, Yahshua is that light, that pillar of of fire by night and the cloud by day. They've got manna, which is like that, that, that bread here. And then Moses is the intercessor. They go through the Jordan River, which is that second veil, and they end up in Canaan land. Everything is going by the tabernacle pattern. If you are down, it's okay, because Yahshua's going to have to resurrect you, because that's his pattern. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Anwar. That was good. Enjoyed that. All right, that brings a close to our class for this evening. Are there any comments or questions? Enjoyed class. All right, class announcements are as follows. Classes are held every Wednesday and Friday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. and Sundays 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. All beginner and instructional meetings are posted on the whiteboard in the back. The Sunday, what's the day today? Um, I don't know. Anyways, this Sunday at 9 a.m. is our second fundamentals class for the month of